Cavalieri's principle states, if two solids are contained between two parallel planes and every plane parallel to these planes intersects both solids in cross sections of equal area, then the volumes of the two solids are equal. Let's prove this fact and apply it to our problem. Consider two solids A and B, each contained between the parallel planes Z equals 0 and Z equals H. Let the cross sections of solids A and B at height Z be A of Z and B of Z, respectively. We're given that for any Z between 0 and H, A of Z equals B of Z. We aim to prove that the volumes of solids A and B are equal. Let's calculate the volume of a solid A. VA is the integral from 0 to H of A of Z, dZ. Now, the volume of solid B. Since their cross sections A of Z and B of Z are equal to each other, for any height Z between 0 and H, then we can write that VA is the integral for the first solid, which equals the integral for the second solid, which is VB. So, VA equals VB. This principle is kind of intuitive, but very important anyway. It is named after the Italian mathematician Bonaventura Cavalieri, who was a student of Galileo Galilei. He worked on indivisibles, which by the name you can tell that it was extremely important for the later development of infinitesimal calculus. It is interesting to mention that despite the fact that Cavalieri developed a complete theory of indivisibles, he denied the fact that the continuum was composed of indivisibles, most likely because of the religious controversies that could arise from it. Let's see Cavalieri's principle applied to three different solids now, and stick to the end because there is a bonus one in higher dimensions. Imagine you have a cylinder with height h, and you carve out of it a paraboloid, with its lowest point at the base, so at the height 0. The cross sections of this solid, for different heights, are rings, such that at the base, the cross section is an entire disk without a single point, corresponding to the minimal point of the paraboloid that you carved out of it. As we move up, the ring gets thinner and thinner, to the point where it's just a circle at the maximum height h. We'll compare this solid with a simpler one, a paraboloid identical to the one you carved out of the first solid, but placed upside down along the vertical axis that measures its height. Its cross sections are simpler, just disks. Let R be the radius of each of these cross sectional disks. R is clearly a function of the height that will denote y, such that y is between 0 and h. For the first carved out paraboloid, the height y and the corresponding length x1 on the base are related through this formula. y equals h times x1 over r squared. I just want to say that I added a free PDF link in the description below, so that you can follow along with all the calculations in detail. It's very useful, since that's the only real way of learning math, by understanding each step and then trying to reproduce everything independently. I also want to say that I offer math and physics consultations, so it's not a class, but rather just you send me a list of questions on a specific subject, and we have an online meeting to clarify all your doubts. Okay, let's get back to the video now. Meanwhile, for the second upside-down paraboloid, we have y equals h minus h times x2 over r squared. Isolating x in each of these equations, we get x1 equals to the square root of y over h times r, and x2 equals to the square root of 1 minus y over h times r, for the first and second paraboloids, respectively. Thus, the areas of their cross-sections at height y are the following, a1 for the ring, and a2 for the disk. Notice that a2 can be written as follows. So, it is basically the same as a1. So, since the cross-sectional areas for different heights of these two solids are the same, we can apply Cavalieri's principle, which tells us that their volumes must be the same as well. Let us see now the napkin ring problem. 
Assume a right circular cylinder whose axis goes through the center of a sphere with radius capital R. Let H be the height of the cylinder segment that is within the sphere. This band is the region of the sphere that lies outside the cylinder. There are three radii involved here. The first one we already talked about, namely capital R, or the radius of the sphere. The second is the radius that we will call R1, corresponding to the radius of the cylinder. And the third is R2, which is this horizontal length, in green, formed when you pick a specific point at a specific height y in the band. So we can write these radii as R1 equals the square root of capital R squared minus h over 2 squared. And R2 is equal to the square root of capital R squared minus y squared. Now, the cross-sectional area of this band can be expressed as a is equal to pi r2 squared minus pi r1 squared, which equals pi times h squared over 4 minus y squared. The cross-sectioned area does not depend on the radius of the sphere. And thus, by Cavalieri's principle, the volume of the band is the integral, from minus h over 2 to h over 2 of a dy. Working on the math here, we get pi h cubed over 6 for all spheres of all radii. In other words, it doesn't matter if this band goes around planet Earth or around a basketball. Their volumes are the same. Pretty impressive, huh? The third problem, and the most interesting one, is the one in which we want to compare a cone of radius capital R with a pyramid with square base, where each side of the square has a measure, which we will denote here as A. Let's study the pyramid first. If we have a height y between 0 and h, then we notice two similar triangles inside the pyramid. Making this ratio height over hypotenuse, we get for the first one h over the square root of h squared plus a over 2 squared, which is the same as the second one, which is y over the square root of y squared plus a minus x over 2 squared. And this implies, working on the math here, that x equals a times 1 minus y over h. So we found x is a function of the height y. Now, let's turn to the cone. We want to find a way of expressing different radii of cross sections of the cone as a function of the height y. Again, we notice two similar triangles, but this time inside of the cone. And we create this ratio, height over hypotenuse. The hypotenuse is also called the slant height. Working on the math, we get a relation between little r and the height y. I want the two cross-sectional areas to be the same, and this for every height. So let's start with the height y equals 0. In other words, the basis. Their areas must be the same. The area of the circle is pi times capital R squared, and the area of the square is just a squared. Since these two areas must be the same, we get that capital R equals A over the square root of pi. That's our condition. Now let's put together everything we've found out so far. Using these functions, we can calculate the respective cross-sectional areas for any height y between 0 and h. And working on the math here, we find out that they have the exact same area. So their cross-sectional areas are indeed the same, just as required by Cavalieri's principle. And applying this principle now, without performing any further calculations, we can confidently conclude that their volumes are going to be the same as well. To finish the video, let's extend the same example of the cone and pyramid to four dimensions. Now we use a hypercone instead, in other words, a cone in four dimensions with a three-dimensional base corresponding to a sphere of radius capital R, an apex, aka the highest point, at height h along the fourth direction. And then we compare it to a hyperpyramid, in other words, a pyramid in four dimensions with a three-dimensional base corresponding to a cube of side a, an apex at height h along the fourth dimension. In this new scenario, Cavalieri's principle needs to be rephrased.
if two four-dimensional solids have the same three-dimensional cross-sectional volume at every height along the fourth dimension, then their fourth-dimensional hypervolumes are equal. In the case of the hypercone, as we move up the height along the fourth dimension, the sphere with radius capital R shrinks until it becomes a dot, which is the apex, at maximum height h. The velocity with which this shrinking happens is constant. In other words, the acceleration of this motion is zero. This is so because the slant height of our cone is straight, and as a consequence, the motion is linear. Does that make sense? Let me know in the comment section your thoughts about it. Similarly, in the case of the hyperpyramid, as we move up the height along the fourth dimension, the cube with sides A shrinks in a linear motion until it becomes a dot, which is the apex, at maximum height H. In order to apply Cavalieri's principle, so that we can conclude that they have the same hypervolumes in four dimensions, we need to assure that their cross-sectional volumes in three dimensions are the same for all heights y along the fourth dimension, with y ranging from 0 to h. Let's do something similar to what we've done before. So we see the cube here shrinking until it becomes a dot. This relation is the side of a cubic cross-section of the hyperpyramid as a function of the height y along the fourth dimension. For the sphere, we see it shrinking until it becomes a dot. And we get this relation, which is the radius of a spherical cross-section of the hypercone as a function of the height y along the fourth dimension. Now, the volumes of the two bases must be the same. The volume of the sphere is 4 pi capital R cube over 3, and the volume of the cube is just a cube. And since the two volumes are the same, we have that capital R is A times the cubic root of 3 over 4 pi. Let's put together everything we found out so far. Using these functions, we can calculate their cross-sectional volumes in 3D. Therefore, their hypervolumes, by Cavalieri's principle, must be the same. You can easily generalize it to higher dimensions. For n-dimensional solids, like a hyperpyramid and a hypercone in n dimensions, the n-1 cross-section would have the following hypervolumes. So the hypervolume of the hypercube as a function of the height y, is the same as the hypervolume of the hypersphere as a function of y. For the condition r equals to r, which depends on a, which is something. I don't know what it is, this something. And I would like to ask you guys to help me out here. Please let me know how you would find it. I didn't come up with anything, but let me know in the comment section your thoughts. For the n minus 1 hypersphere, that is the base of the nd hypercone, we would have the following. R of y equals a times something to the power of 1 over n times 1 minus y over h. That's my guess. But please let me know in the comment section if you guys have any suggestions because I really don't know what to put here inside. But I guess it would look like this. If you enjoyed this video, do not forget to like it and to subscribe to the channel. And also, please consider supporting us on Patreon and becoming a member of the channel. The more you guys support Sophia and I, the faster we can publish videos and the better the quality. And check out this video right here. I'm pretty sure you're gonna like it. See you guys there.